petitioning this, uh, this afternoon for your professor who is out doing an experiment on someone's mind in another class. So I don't know exactly what the experiment is, but it kind of scares me. Um, Dr. Aguirre asked me to discuss today the information that starts on page 64 of the textbook, which is uh, information about an environmental scale. Okay, why, why would you be concerned as a person in marketing with an environmental scale? You know, one of the things that you learn pretty quick in life is that things go much better the more information you possess. It's, it's hard to make good decisions if you have all the information, unless you're just absolutely the luckiest person on earth. It's impossible to make good decisions if you don't have enough information. Yeah, sometimes you can luck into you know, good uh, chance will play its part, and you'll luck into a good decision. But I wouldn't count on that. Uh, it's, those are few and far between. So, Environmental scanning is all about acquiring information from outside of your environment. And the book talks about the five environmental trends that can affect your business. There are social trends, economic trends, technological trends, competitive trends, and regu regulative trends. And we're going to go through each one of these five briefly and talk about what those terms mean and how they can affect your business. And in the meantime, um, my rationale, I guess, for being here is that I teach a class on the Uniform Commercial Code. And some of this stuff has directly, some of these trends have directly impacted the Uniform Commercial Code. In other words, the Uniform Commercial Code the law, it's all, it's all law, it's in uh, the statutes, Title 12A, uh, and it, it has been affected by these trends in, in the outside environment. So let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, first of all, on page 64, there's a little blurb there that talks about tracking environmental trends. And, uh, it, it's discussing the coffee business, all right? Well, it's talking about the sale of coffee for use at home versus the sale of coffee by the cup, in other words, for consumption on premises. So the difference between uh, the other day when I went to Walmart, I had to buy coffee so I could make coffee this morning at home, versus going over to the Starbucks and the student union and buying whatever you like over there. Talks about the difference, um, the different trends among different age groups. For instance, your age group is more likely to drink coffee in a coffee house or over at Starbucks uh, or drink a beverage at, at a Starbucks. Although, frankly, I think I'm right there behind you. Why, why is that? Well, I think there's social aspects to, to going and getting a cup of coffee. You know, uh, I hang out a lot in Barnes & Noble down at like 61st in May Avenue in the city, whatever the address is. And you see on Sunday afternoon, wall-to-wall -wall students in their high school or college, wherever they're from, they've got their backpacks <coughs> full of books, they're sitting four to a table, notebooks full of information, and they're talking about what they need to do for a class or what chapter 12 says about this or that. They don't see as many people my age doing that because we're out of school. You know, I might go down there and drink coffee and eat a scone, but I'm reading some mystery novel or I'm reading, you know, some other book that is boring, uh, as you know, will bore everyone to tears. But I'm probably, sometimes I'm reading the stuff from my UCC class. I've got to admit that. All right. So if you are a marketer for a coffee company, let's say Starbucks or a, a Seattle's Best or some of those places, the way you would market 
you would need to know how you marketed that product is going to be is going to vary based on who you're trying to sell it to, right? How, how many of you, how many people in here have a Bentley? How many people drive a Bentley? Do you have a Bentley? Yeah. What year? Uh, 2014. Okay. Okay. What model? Okay. Um, 
one of the things the book points out is, is there's a population explosion going on in the world. Uh, there was a book written 50 years ago or so called The Population Ball, and I read it, you know, maybe 45 years ago. I read the thing and it's scary, because it's talking about how's the earth going to ever, um, ever support this many people. Well, if you look at the demographics, where's the population growing? Population is growing in Asia, Africa, and South America. Population isn't really growing that much in the United States or Canada or Western Europe. Uh, as a matter of fact, Western Europe is having, some places are having some problems keeping their population steady. Um, the United States population would be a, uh, a steady, you know, where we're birthing them as quick as they're dying off at the other end if it weren't for immigration. Immigration is keeping the country growing. Why do you need to know about that? Well, you need to know about that because that's going to open up whole new markets. You know, China is a new market. When, when I was in college, I was your age, why would anybody want to sell anything to China? They didn't have any money. But they went through this little economic reform. You know, sure, they still have the Communist Party, <coughs> but they also have a free enterprise system that's been bolted on to the Communist Party. And now they're a good market. If you were selling Bentleys rather than interested in buying a Bentley, you might find a whole new world of opportunity in China or uh, other countries that used to not have enough money to be able to afford those kinds of consumer goods. Okay, age. By 2050, there's going to be 2 billion people on Earth over 60 years of age. Why is that important? I'm not there yet, but for every year after 40, chances are people are going to consume less health care and, I mean, more health care and fewer kayaking trips. Okay? I'm not at all interested in kayaking down the Colorado River or anywhere else for that matter. Okay, but I'm real interested in making sure I take my multivitamin every day, you know, the Centrum Silver, and um, my uh, Omega Red supplement, the fish oil supplement, so my poor little heart will stay open. That's, that's all stuff, unless, unless you're eating Flintstone chewables, you're not doing that. Right? Or maybe maybe you are, maybe you're helping that you're doing that. And your age group, you're not worried about stuff like that yet. You're worried about buying cars and you're worried about uh, maybe buying a house, or you're worried about being able to afford dates Friday and Saturday night. As opposed to me that I'm perfectly willing to sit at home on Friday night, but I want my central silver vitamin. I want to make sure I have good health insurance so if I need to go to the hospital and have my right ear put back on or whatever, I've got the insurance that lets me do that. Uh, if you ever watch daytime television, you'll see a lot of ads for WAVA down at the hearing aid center. Yeah, there's people your age who, who have to have hearing aids, but statistics tell us I'm a lot more likely to have to use a hearing aid than you are, right? Uh, just because as you age, your health problems start to uh, start to gain on you. Uh, you need to know per capita income. They have some interesting statistics in the book about uh, that the average person in Norway, the per capita income in Norway is eighty-four thousand dollars. In Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, it's three hundred and thirty dollars per person. Well, if you're marketing. Um, what do you want to market? A Lexus? Are you going to try to market that car in Norway, or are you going to try to market that car in Ethiopia, where um, the typical person couldn't afford the hubcap, let alone the car? You need to know that kind of thing. Um, household changes. In 1960, 75% of the households in the United States were consisted of married couples. 2.7 children, a lot of them, okay? But 
75% of the households contain married couples. In 2010, that was down to 50%. Uh, but only 21% of, of the people of the households were married with children. It used to be a television show. <coughs> with Al Bundy. Anybody have ever seen that in reruns? It, it's, it's really an obnoxious show, but I kind of like it. Okay. 10% of the households are working fathers with stay-at-home moms. All right. When I was when I was born, I was born, I'm a baby boomer, and I was born in a baby boom suburb. Well, I wasn't born, I was born in the hospital, but I grew up in a baby boom suburb. In other words, the the addition was was built. Uh, in the 50s, and everybody on my street was a married couple with a ton of kids. And it was a lot of fun for me, because when I was a little kid, you had lots of built-in people that you could go down to the park and play baseball with, or ride your bikes with, or whatever. If you went on that street now, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed to find a kid, because it's all uh, people my age or older and their kids are long gone, maybe they get the grandkids back. That happens sometimes, you know, where for whatever reason you end up raising your grandkids or you end up raising your great nieces and nephews, but your kids are gone. They're out, they've got their own houses. Well, how you market things, that, that's an important demographic right there. If you're going to market uh, food products, and you know that only 10% of the households in the United States consist of a stay-at-home mom, your, your ad campaign, your marketing campaign, is going to be significantly different than everybody remember Leave it to Beaver, where the mother, June Cleaver, stayed home and cooked and cleaned and ironed all day? Okay, so even, how many people own an iron? So, uh, give me your phone number. Would you be interested in making a little extra money? No, but I have an iron because sometimes you have to do little spot things. I throw, I throw my shirts, you know. It's too hot to wear a shirt, you know, a dress shirt and a tie. Um, that I'm kind of a slob. So, I just throw them off at the laundry, you know, and, and you need your whatever dry clean, you throw that off too. That would have killed my parents to think about doing that, right? My dad did that when he was 80 years old. He was too old and tired to iron. You know, the iron, food products now are uh, marketed according to, yeah, sometimes a little bit of nutrition, most of which is misleading. It's convenience. You know, how do you get food, in the words of George W. Bush, how do you put food on your family? as quick and easy as you can because mom's worked all day just like dad because now it takes two incomes in 90% of the, in the married households. Okay, the, the age demographics is going to affect lots of marketing like uh, uh, homes. Are you going to build, are you marketing starter homes or are you marketing the houses in the larger? You're going to have a different client base. Uh, are you marketing weddings when people aren't getting married as much anymore? Um, how do you market baby clothes and baby formula and stuff like that? Are you going to market it on convenience or are you going to market it and, and fast? Or are you going to market on comfort for the baby and all that stuff? Well, it depends on who you're, who you're trying to get your message to. Um, you, will, you will really appreciate this in 30 years, it's a big eye-opener when you start getting letters from the AARP asking you to join, and your friends from high school start calling you wanting to sell you burial insurance, or a pre-need burial plan where, you know, they'll lay you out in a nice casket and have a spot just for you. You know, I don't want to worry about that. You know, I've got, I've got 20 more years till my house is paid off. 
I've got to be around at least 20 years, and then what do I care? I'll be dead. I don't care what they do. You know, that's my that's my family's problem, not mine. But a lot of people worry about stuff like that. So if you're ever marketing uh, caskets, you need to know who to who to take that message to. All right. Uh, where we live has changed. That's another social trend. <coughs> we don't live on farms much anymore. Um, Thirty percent of us live in central cities, like I do. I grew up in Guthrie. I lived in Guthrie for 46 years. Now I live uh, just north of Paseo in Oklahoma City. Where I live um, 30 years ago, nobody in my place, position, time, and life would want to live there. Now I love it because I can walk down to Paseo or, you know, I've walked downtown before. If you go to a Thunder game, and you get a little over, overly excited, you can just five bucks and you're in a cab headed home. Very handy for me. 50% um, of the people still live in the suburbs, and 20% live in rural areas, but that's a little misleading because rural areas doesn't mean farm. Uh, it can mean places like around Enid. You know, Enid's big enough to have its own metropolitan area and, but you still are counted uh, census-wise in a rural area. Okay, um, you've got some other things going on. Um, we have a much more diverse country, uh, race and national origin-wise, than we had in the 50s, let's say, and you need to know those factors and how the market to people that, that are members of the diverse community. Um, changing role of women. My mom was a school teacher, but most of her friends were stay-at-home moms. And what my mom worried about was a lot different than what the stay-at-home moms worried about. They don't have as many stay-at-home moms now. They have lots of women in the workplace doing their job that they want to do or have to do, as the case may be. And you need to know how that affects your market plan, your marketing plan. Okay, let's look at the economic forces. This is really pretty simple. Think about this. You, uh, if you're a traditionally aged student, you might be a little bit young, because this is a fundamentals class, but just think about it. Okay, in, in 2004, Lots of people were out buying new cars and new houses, and they wanted uh, they wanted the new house with the outdoor kitchen. Anybody ever watch HGTV? For a while, they were all concerned that everybody put at least a hundred grand into an outdoor kitchen. You know, I don't even want to spend a hundred grand on a house. I had to, but I didn't want to. Uh, I don't have an outdoor kitchen. I have a charcoal grill, but. People like that kind of stuff, okay? And if the economy is, is doing well, you can sell those things. You can sell people a new Lexus when really they ought to be buying a Chevy Impala or something like that. Um, you, can, you can sell trips, trips to Europe. Uh, you can sell lot, lots of things if the economy is doing well. But we have an economy um, that periodically doesn't do so well, like in 2007, 2008. So I can make my car last another couple of years. I don't worry about having a outdoor kitchen in my house. I worry about keeping the house, right? When, when you see people around you losing their jobs, even if you have a job, you get nervous about keeping it. So you're... Um, your wants and expectations start going down. And, and we just lived through that. Car sales were way off, trips were way off, tourism was way off, everything was uh, doing poorly because the consumer got nervous because the economy wasn't doing well. Um, we live in a country where two thirds of our economy is consumer spending, okay? Part of consumer spending is going to go on uh, unless things just get drastically rotten. 
uh, I've got to go to the grocery store. I've got to go to Walmart neighborhood market after class because I need dog food. I have I have three yappy little dogs, okay, and they expect the minute I have a 5:45 class tonight. It'll be over at seven o'clock. I'm gonna go straight to Walmart and then home. So I'll be home by a quarter of eight. When I hit the door, they want to be fed. Okay, they they demand a they share a can of pedigree chopped chicken dog food every evening. That's what their expectations are. And I better deliver. <laughs> you know, or they're gonna bark at me all night and growl, you know. Anyway, all right. If if I lose my job, they might be fed dry dog food because I don't have enough money to buy the canned stuff. Um, but I'm still gonna buy some kind of dog food because I need to feed my dogs. That is sort of the segue into <coughs> what the book talks about as discretionary income. And that's like the that's the sweet spot of marketing. In other words, the house payments paid, the car payments paid, and I and the utilities are all paid, there's food on the table, and I've got a thousand bucks left over. What am I going to do with that? That's your discretionary income. That's the money that I can just spend. Yeah. Do you consider do you like saving and then and then all that income? Well, yeah. Savings is uh, more of a disposable income, and what happens? This is another thing that the economy affects. The savings rate in the United States at, during the last recession went to zero. Uh, okay, for a thousand years, well not a thousand years in the United States, but you know, everybody else says save 10% of your salary. We were down to zero. Okay, because you can choose to not save. And you may have to divert those savings um, into expenses, like you know. Your spouse loses the job, so now you're not saving anything, but you're able to keep the house. Or you are able to, you know, to go to the restaurant for a meal rather than having to cook oxtail soup and have that seven nights in a row. The discretionary is more like your mad money. You know, what hobbies are an example of that? I like I like to read that I like, I have two well. I guess drinking beer isn't really a hobby, but uh, I have two hobbies. I read and I walk, obviously not enough, but uh, that's what I like to do. I <coughs> used to play sports. I've broken too many bones and I'm too old to be any good at those, and I don't like to do much of anything I'm not any good at, so I don't play tennis anymore because I, I can't run around and get the ball because of a bad ankle, uh, but I can walk all day long and it's good for you. It's a very low cost hobby. Reading, on the other hand, can be a high cost hobby. Okay? Now, if I have lots of discretionary income, I'm going to go to Barnes and Noble or Best of Books up on Danforth or Full Circle down in 55th Place, and I'm going to see that new book that I'm really interested in. And here's my $32 with tax, and I'm going to take that home and I'm going to read it. And I have several friends that I pass books on to and they pass books to me. Or if I really like it, I'm going to keep it. If I don't have any discretionary income, I'm going to read that, live, that book from the library. So that's, that's discretionary income. Sometimes you go up market. Like if I had a ton of discretionary income and I was the typical person, I'm a cheapskate, I'll admit it. I love my Honda Civic. If I, if I bought a Honda Civic because that's what I could afford and I get a big pay raise, I might go get a Lexus, you know, maybe. Most, most people would. Most people would find a way to spend that money on something. Um, and the reason I call that the sweet spot is because that's where you can convince people that wants or needs. Um, you know, when I was, this, this wasn't, this classroom wasn't here when I was a student at this school. But when I was a student at this school, 
nobody had these things. The President of the United States, King of the Universe, didn't have a cell phone because there were no cell phones. There were mobile phones. They took all of the trunk of your car and you had a whipping antenna that made you look like a highway patrol car um, coming, coming off your car because it was a radio, not a telephone. Right? Now, how many people have uh, iPhones or uh, Android or something like that? Pra practically everybody, right? Um, when I was a kid, nobody had color television. How many black and white televisions sold last year? None, I guess. Um, so, uh, once, if, if you have a sufficient feed-in of discretionary income once become means. All right? This is a good example. This was on sale, by the way, but my Tommy shirt, if you don't have any discretionary income, you get the shirt at J.C. Penney's. <coughs> if you have a little bit of discretionary income, you go over to Dillard's and buy the Tommy. But again, it was on sale, so it was a good deal because I don't do retail. Um, Except food, you know, that kind of thing, you can't really help. Okay, that's a good segue into the next one, which is you have to do environmental scanning for technology. I can absolutely guarantee you that 30 years ago, none of you would have worked at the Apple store in the mall, because there was no Apple store at the mall. You might have worked for uh, Southwestern Bell installing phones in Grandma's house. Right, with the rotary dial. That's getting maybe a little bit longer than 30 years ago. Technology changes things. When I was a kid, uh, if you bought a, a Chevrolet Impala, you got crank up windows, an AM radio, an air conditioner if you were lucky, power steering and power brakes. Okay. They don't make those anymore. Everybody has power windows, power door locks, some sort of sound system, right, with a MP3 feed or something, okay, or OnStar. My aunt has a Cadillac. I was driving her Cadillac one day, and I guess I hit the button, and all of a sudden this voice said, yes, Miss Baldwin? I thought it was the voice of God. Talking to me. It was Cadillac, CTS. I thought, I thought it was all over for me, you know? I was waiting for the trumpet call. But fortunately, my aunt had the presence of mind to say, oh, we don't need anything, I just have a clumsy nephew. So anyway, you've got to know what the, uh, what the technological trends are. Um, that has two aspects, I think. New, new products, right? Again, I have, I have a Nook that I bought at Barnes & Noble. I love the thing, right? It's a Nook tablet. If I have to go to a conference, I take it, I can check my email on it, you know, I can get on websites on it. But the best thing about it is, is if the conference is really boring, I can put it right down by my materials, and they think I'm taking notes on it. And I'm not. I'm reading a novel, you know, or reading the materials or doing something, or uh, whatever I want to do, right? Couldn't have done that 20 years ago because they didn't exist. But there's also another aspect of the technological trends. That is, um, an example of that is social media. Nobody marketed on social media 20 years ago 